Well, good morning. I'm sorry about the mix-ups yesterday. Uh, there was a university-wide password reset for faculty and other stuff, and I'm wondering if that's why the recording wasn't working, because as we were trying to talk and stuff, I kept having Windows pop up telling me to reset passwords and things, and I think that, that that's what was going on, because everything seems to be working just fine today. It's really weird because, like I said, it it I I've never recorded a lecture before, but I thought, well, I didn't know what the students would do if it wouldn't record, so I just I just started recording, and it was recording on my end, and I think it put it. I'm pretty sure it put it in the chat, but I couldn't understand why you couldn't record. So it must have been that with the faculty. It was just it was just super weird. Whatever happened with your um. Your flood, did it? Did it do a Did it rain that much? No, everything was totally fine. It did That's rain. So it rained quite a bit, so I didn't have to go home and water the grass. But uh, <laughs> there was no. I think the only flooding happened in areas where um, people weren't didn't plan on drainage right. Yeah. You know, uh, some of the parks had really big ponds, and it. That just happens when people don't uh, plan the grading of the ground. Yeah. To accommodate water flow. Well, good. That's good for you, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm glad that nothing, nothing happened. But I didn't. You know, to make sandbags, you buy the sand, you put them in the bags, and instead of doing that, I bought topsoil in the plastic bags, left it, left it. Oh, good idea. Place and now I'll wait a couple days for the water to boil out and then I'll take it back and get my money back. <laughs> Jerk thing to do, but there it is. I thought you said you were going to put it in your ground, use the the dirt in your ground. No, there's our backyard is like 25 square feet, so oh, there's really not a place to to put it. It's great because I just mowed the lawn with the yard trimmer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, That's good. We're gonna, since, since we're actually recording, I'm going to just use the same code words as yesterday. So the first one is weird. All right. And today it looks like we've got Amy's here. Janae is here. Looks like Ashley's here. Is that Sierra? Yep. Okay. And Shaoshan? All right, excellent. Now, although we did go over the quiz yesterday, or um, a couple of the elements of the quiz. What I think I would like to do is just start, um, I would just go over the quiz again. Let's see. If that's all right with everybody, we'll go, we'll go over it kind of quickly and then what we'll do is uh, talk about the other two things that I wanted to discuss. And then if anybody has any questions, that'd be super. I really appreciate uh, everybody who is showing up today because I know that this is not a regularly scheduled class. Uh, but with the issues that we had yesterday, I'm very grateful that people are showing up. All righty, let's see. I'm going to do a screen share. Right now, yesterday, I can everybody see my screen with the quiz on it? Yes. Excellent. Uh, yesterday, I had everybody just talk about two textures. I think one of the most difficult things about this, believe it or not, is you have the list of the six that are included in the question. Not repeating those six is the hardest part of the whole assignment. 
So let, let's hear from everybody. And you can say the same two that you said yesterday. Let's hear uh, two textures from everybody. Okay, I would say fluffy and rigid. Fluffy and rigid, that's good. Excellent. I'm going to say matted and slimy. Smooth and grainy. Smooth and grainy. Okay, smooth is one of the, on uh, one of the six on this list. So, do you have another one other than smooth? Slippery is that a texture? <laughs> yeah, it is now. No, that's great. Excellent texture. All right, who's next? Velvety and sleek, or uh, sleek or silky. Velvety and sleek. I like those. Excellent. How about bubbly and puckered? Oh, those are excellent. They, especially puckered. It just there's a that, that just that's one of those things that makes me feel very uncomfortable. So, <laughs> well done. All right, and uh, Ashley, did you already go? You went, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I was the first one. Okay, excellent. How about uh, Shaoshan? And you could say the same two you just said yesterday. Oh, Xiaoxiang, you there? Yeah. I'm sorry, the volume, the volume is off. When, when you're working with textures, um, or describing textures, I think Cassie yesterday made a good point that a lot of the times we'll work with textures that we are using to uh, specifically engage uh, emotions and reactions. And although you would think since this is sculpture, we're talking about specifically visual texture, I would think that um, any texture you want to talk about would be good for this. I say that because a lot of the times there's uh, sculptors will find ways of portraying things that we don't even normally uh, consider or think about being able to portray. Uh, people find a way of doing it anyway. So uh, let yourself go crazy on this. And the first, the first few are kind of tough, but after that they just start pouring out. Okay, what's the traditional material used for casting a final product? Bronze. Yes, absolutely. Every, every art medium has like a pinnacle. What's the pinnacle of painting? What's the, the premier material to use for painting? Would it be acrylic? No, it's oil paint. That's that is like the the best one. And uh, bronze is like the pinnacle for for sculpture. So yeah, I, I know I know painters who've been painting for 40 or 50 years that still don't trust acrylic because it's so new. Believe it or not. <laughs> All right. Question number three. In many cases, artificial lighting has more control and is therefore more desirable to the artist. Is that true or false? True. Yes, absolutely. As an artist, you want to be able to, to control, at least to some extent, the impact your work has on an audience. And so artificial lighting for a lot of people is very important, especially when you're in a show. Have any of you ever been in an exhibit or an art show where whoever was lighting it did a horrible job with your piece?
I know it can make a profound difference on what the viewers see if it's not lit correctly. Yeah, ab absolutely. And so that this is a good question. All right, casting is a simple and direct process. Is that true or false? False. Absolutely. There it's just like a lot of other things. The the steps seem to be pretty clear and plain, but there's nothing simple about it. You get things wrong a little bit and uh, everything's get screwed up. I do you want me to tell that gross story about bronze casting again? Everyone's dying to hear. <laughs> you know, it, it would seem that lost wax casting is pretty simple. You basically make a mold out of, or you make a principle out of wax. You cover it with like a ceramic shell. He, uh, heat up the ceramic shell and then pour molten metal in it. Anybody who does jewelry or anything, that's, that's basically how you do it. With bronze, you have to get the, the ceramic shell hot enough that it's glowing, get the bronze to over 2,000 degrees, and then pour it in. If you put any cold bronze or room temperature bronze into the molten bronze, two things happen right away. One, there's a sudden condensation, and then the water will explode into gas as the, the cold bronze hits the, the molten bronze. And the other is the um, solid bronze is more compact than liquid bronze. And so it starts expanding right away. And uh, when I was teaching bronze casting at BYU, one of the people that was training me mentioned that somebody had put in a cold ingot into the hot bronze and it exploded. It shot the molten bronze out and a little blob about the size of a marble landed on the top of this guy's foot. And the guy didn't even feel it. It melted right through his foot onto the floor. And uh, I, when the guy stepped up, he had a hole through his foot, but it happened so quickly. He didn't feel anything until, you know, like a day or so later. So the moral of the story is when somebody gives you directions, it's a good idea to follow them. And casting is not a simple and direct process. All right. That was a repeat of yesterday's story performance for the benefit of all of our listeners exploring the, the wonders of modern technology watching the recorded video. Okay, question number five. Visual texture is primarily experienced with the eyes. Is this true or false? It's true. Why would you say that? Um, okay, I'd written down that it was true, but thinking about it, um, well, once, if we're not there, usually even if you're there in person, you can't touch the artwork. So I think no matter what, usually you have to experience it with your eyes. Yeah, and, and the other is that this is visual texture. So yes, very, very good. Yeah, if you walk into a museum or exhibit, unless you get express permission, it's a bad idea to touch anything. But yeah, visual texture is primarily experienced with the eyes. Good. Now, question number six, is this true or false? Natural light is always changing and is not fully under the control of the artist. True. Yes, absolutely. Sometimes it's not a bad thing. A lot of the times it's not bad, but again, if you are trying to design a specific response or engineer a specific response, it helps to have as much in your control as the artist as possible. Uh, who can recap what happened with French and the Lincoln Memorial? He basically demanded to have more funds given so that he could light his own sculpture because he knew um, the effects of lighting and how it could affect the face of, I mean, as simple as the face of Lincoln. He looked really scary when it was, you know, he sent a picture showing how scary 
he could actually look. <laughs> if it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't lit correctly. Well, and that, that one example, I think if I remember right, he did several examples. But the one that sticks out in my mind is the one where it was lit specifically like the way they wanted to light it, not French. And it made Abraham Lincoln look completely baffled. Which I, I thought was kind of funny because that was not the look they were going for. But yeah, very good. All right, in um, two or three sentences, compare and contrast how the two artists below are using light as a medium. So in one sentence, I'd like you just to describe each one. Like uh, James Terrell is using natural light with a lot of curvy, flowy lines. And Dan Flavin is using artificial light that is very cold and uh, set in a very angular space. And that, that would be good for a first sentence. Now, what, what makes these two feel di so different? Or what about each one makes them feel different? I think with um, James Terrell, since it's natural light, I like how he used organic shapes because it just feels like it ties the whole thing together. And same with the other person, how they used artificial light, but they have more of like those geometric kind of artificial shapes, which is interesting. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really good observation. And I, what I like about what you, what you were saying, too, is the awareness that these shapes were used specifically for the light effects. I mean, the Dan Flavin's piece, I think, would feel so much different if it was all with circles and designed with calming things. They, they weren't, wouldn't really fit together. And I think James Terrell, if he had used these off-balance, off-kilter angles, um, it would not be the same with natural sunlight. So, yeah, I, I really like that observation. Excellent. All right. Do you remember what the term was where uh, artists will make essentially a textural optical illusion? There's a French one and an English one. I don't exactly know how to say it, but I know it's like Trump Lair. Let, help me out yeah. there. It's full of I don't know how to say it either. So I say it with confidence because then if you say it with confidence, the assumption of your audience is, she must know what she's saying. Therefore, I did not hear it right. So, but uh, it, yeah, it's trompe l'oeil. And do you remember, does anybody remember what the English version of that is? Full the eye. Yes, ex exactly. There's a local artist, uh, he teaches at BYU, his name is Brian Christensen. He does a really good job at this. I did an exhibit with one of his works last year where uh, he made, he used like a terracotta ceramics and made the perfect dollar store flip flops uh, that looked really worn and everything. And we thought when he delivered them and they were set on the pedestal, they looked, we thought somebody just put flip flops on the pedestal and the curator went to go pick it up. And that's when we found out that it actually was ceramic because he had done such a good job mimicking the uh, texture and everything. So, yeah, I think that's kind of wild. Oh, do you remember? This reminds me in that very first quiz. Do you remember what the two uh, extremes? Oh, did we lose? OK, am I still doing screen share? Yes. OK, do you remember what the two extremes of the um, use of materials are from the very first quiz. You mean for hyper realism or two extremes of the two the two extremes of material use in the first quiz that we took. The first extreme was making the material look more like what it is. Like when you polish wood and put a really nice stain on it or something, or uh, the stone is allowed to age naturally like a spiral jetty. And then what's the other extreme? Uh, 
Does anybody remember? It's essentially making the material look like something completely different. And that's that's what this trompe l'oeil or fool of the eye represents. Right now, this question you can you could probably write a book about this if you really wanted to, but this is talking about um, manipulation of the surface of an object to enhance its beauty is intimately bound to cultural and historical definitions of beauty. Who can give me examples of historical and cultural definitions of beauty that maybe don't completely tie in with uh, today's views and standards. One thing I'm thinking of is, does anybody remember King Tutankhamun's father, uh, King Akhenaten? Uh, do you guys remember the statues of him and how they differed from the standard Egyptian statue? Yeah, was it the statues that were like fatter and looked alien like? Like they had bellies and stuff, and the women and men were the same size? Is that right? Or was that a different one? No, that's exactly right. Yeah, his face was. You were so used to seeing the Egyptian uh, proportionate canon where the, the hips and shoulders are from a full view, and everything else is side view. The body is a specific number of heads high, and all those kinds of things. And Akhenaten had the audacity to show, or to have statues built that actually showed him looking the way he did in real life, perhaps, with you know a little pouchy belly, and a, a head that wasn't following the the strict Egyptian canon of uh, human proportion. But yeah, that's a good that that's one example. Can anybody think of any other examples? I think someone mentioned yesterday that um, in Africa they will stretch their necks using adding rings to around their necks that lengthens the neck, or or they'll use. Um, I know they'll do scarring in some cultures that they believe is beautiful, but very painful, I'm sure, to create. Yeah, those are both really good examples. Uh, is anybody familiar with uh, the example of uh, cradle boarding? Did anybody hear about that? In uh, Central America, in Peru, so South America, then also in a lot of the uh, Plains nations in, in North America, there was a practice where uh, babies would, when they were strapped to a cradle board, they, uh, their head, heads might be bound as well. And a lot of the times, since the baby's skulls are so soft, it would distort the shape of their head. And... Uh, when they would grow up, their their head would look very long, and it was considered uh, be absolutely beautiful. Uh, let, let's hear another couple examples. What are some other things that historical definitions of beauty may seem a little bit odd or or different than what we we're, we're used to? And like. France during Marie Antoinette's time, they had the crazy powdered wigs and hair that we obviously do not do anymore, but that was definitely different. Oh yeah, that, that's for sure. I've, I've heard stories that uh, some of the people would make those powdered wigs that they would just reuse and over and over and over again. And sometimes uh, like rodents would uh, start nesting in them. <laughs> That'd be kind of a surprise, especially if you found out during a party. Yeah, that's a really good example. How about one more example?
One of the examples from yesterday was uh, foot binding, which that's got to be incredibly, incredibly painful. But I'm also thinking we go more contemporary. I know some uh, women who are dancers that they don't necessarily bind their feet in the same way, but because of the their job essentially and the types of shoes they have to wear to support their feet, um, their feet endure an awful lot of damage uh, for for similar reasons. I guess you could also say the orthodontic work could be painful when you have braces. Yeah, that's that's true, and I I think that that whether or not it, it's painful. That ties directly in with this too. It is, um, there's an idea of enhancing beauty by uh, changing somebody's, the placement of somebody's teeth. And, you know, and that, that's very contemporary. There's other ones too. I mean, there is more money spent on assuaging the guilt that advertisers persuade us of that we're not beautiful enough or we're not whatever enough there's more money spent on cosmetics than almost anything else it is you know it's one of the the biggest uh industries out there and it's based on this idea that the way we are just isn't right which i think is kind of sad okay we get the second code word is going to be snore Now on this this one, this is kind of an interesting. This one is talking about worked and natural textures. Uh, worked textures are textures that the artist specifically has manipulated. Natural are textures that come into the possession of the artist the way they are. And some of these are really kind of difficult. And I what I want you to do is whether or not you get or if you don't get all of these right i would like you to um send me a comment and let me know why you thought it was the way uh you said and uh, i'll give you i'll give you credit for the point now on some of these like uh, this one number three i'm thinking this looks worked because it looks like everything was sculpted that way I'm thinking this one has worked because it looks like everything was sculpted that way. But some of the tricky ones are like this one. What do, you, what do you think? Do you think this is natural or worked? I mean, I was thinking about that one because I think that it could be debated either way, but tin, I mean, the structure that it came from, whether it was an old car or a tin can or whatever, it was still formed at one point, but if you're going from just the natural medium, then then you could just say that it was it was natural. I mean, it was um, you could just say that it came from a natural medium, couldn't you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And since we're we're talking about this from the standpoint of how does the artist receive it? I don't think the artist changed the texture very much, so this is definitely a natural one. I actually also thought the same thing about number one, because in the book it talked about not, you know, if, if the bark was removed, it it could be stated that it was um, worked if the bark had been removed. And so I kind of went back and forth on that one, but, and I ended up getting it wrong. <laughs> well, again, uh, if you got it wrong, just, um, just submit a comment and let me know what you're thinking, you know, and it's it's more important that you uh, explain to me or articulate what you're thinking. Because uh, most of the time that's that's what gets it. That's what gets you the point. Now, if we go down here. This is just a gallery floor covered with dirt. Is that texture natural or worked? I would guess that maybe it's natural. 
Yeah, absolutely. How about this? Uh, the teacup, the, I'm sorry, the teacup cover with fur. I think Merritt Oppenheim is one of my favorite sculptors of all time. I, th I think she's absolutely amazing. Is this, this fur covered teacup, is that natural or worked? I mean, it's definitely natural. Yeah, absolutely. It's been done. And it, it feels very disconcerting, doesn't it? But yeah, it's definitely natural. Now on this one, this is the, the last question for the quiz. Again, I want you to draw on your vocabulary. And when you write this four or five sentences, I want you to talk about the texture. Uh, you can't really blow this up an awful lot, but you can find other images on on the internet of uh, the stabler standing man with outstretched arm. But I want you to describe the texture, talk about the color, and then also talk about just the angles. You know, kind of describe what you what you're seeing as you see this, and then. After you do that, I want you to discuss how you feel the artist has involved you as a viewer. I think um, the texture is bumpy enough that it engages you visually and you can almost, even though you're not allowed to touch it, you can almost feel the texture because of how bumpy it is, how rough it is. And with these angles and, you know, like the this coming down to a point right there to the base, it almost feels like it's wants to fall over and then engages you as well. You're, um, you're engaged as a viewer because of the dy dynamic posture of the sculpture. And so, you know, talk about those things as well in this and try to use your vocabulary from that, uh, tools of artistic critique page that we, that uh, we talked about at the very beginning of, the course that everybody went to. This thing doesn't look like it. It looks kind of short in the photo, but it's actually eight feet tall from here to the base, which I think if you were there in person, that's another way of engaging you. It talks about scale like uh, we did in the previous quiz. All right, I am going to turn off screen share now. Hopefully, if I can. All right, there, great. Now, what I wanted to do, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about, well, first, does anybody have any questions about the quiz? If nobody has any questions about the quiz, then I'm going to go to Tools of Artistic Critique. And I'm going to do another screen share again. Hopefully, let's see if we can get there.
And what I've noticed is that all of you guys are doing that. I have yet to see anybody do a response that's like, uh, oh, that's so pretty, and leave it like that. The typical response you guys are giving is something along the lines of, this is cool. I love the way that you use texture to draw the viewer in. Or I love the way that you've designed this so that the angles are such that I want to see more of it. So you guys are doing a great job on that. Now the third assignment is to take one of your own pieces and critique it as if it's not yours. And as well as take somebody else's image from one of the discussion boards and critique it going through and you'll do both of those by going through all four steps of the tools of artistic critique. And uh, for this online class, what you'll do is make a recording of it. The simplest way that people have done this is either with their phone or their computer where they pull up the picture of the thing that they're critiquing and then just go down the four steps. Okay, one, two, three, four. Is there a time? Is there a time limit to how long you need to critique? Kind of like your PowerPoint, or does it matter? Just as long as you give the critique. Two to three minutes is good. Any shorter than two minutes, it, it's not very much. But you can see, you go to our the uh, YouTube channel, you'll see the average is right around two and a half to three and a half minutes. Okay, Xu Chen, are you here? Yes. All right, great. Okay, I'm going to give me just a second here. I'm going to see if I can uh, give an example of this. So you guys have a better idea of what I'm what I'm talking about. Okay, and this will be an example of somebody else's work. So here, give me just a second here. All right, can everybody see this image? Yep. Now, what are the, does anybody remember the four steps to tools of artistic critique? What's the first step? Describe it. Excellent. What's the second step? Um, is it analysis? Yes, absolutely. What's the third step? Anybody remember? It starts with an I. Interpretation. Excellent. And then what's the fourth step? Judgment or evaluation. Yes, excellent. And when you do this, if you have the paper in front of you, it's pretty easy just to talk about the piece and then answer a couple of the questions. So on this one, for description, so I don't know exactly how tall this is, but if it's the fits into kind of the mass of the styrofoam all of us were given, I'd say this is probably about 10 to 12 inches tall. And maybe the width is about 14 to 15 inches. It's made out of carved styrofoam covered with uh, paper mache. Just like in the description that we were, were given, it looks to me that after the paper mache dried, the artist uh, painted it and it looks like to me they painted it all black and then applied stripes of color on top of it the reason i say that is because it looks like there's the black lines in between each color line 
and it looks like to me that there's a little bit of black showing through the color stripes. And so that's why I'm thinking maybe the color, the colors were applied after the black uh, coated the entire thing. <clears throat> I don't know if this is a, a abstract or non-objective. I don't recognize that it has its origin in anything, but um, I'm going to say it is definitely at, at the very least abstract. The, the black is very strong. I notice on the left-hand side there, they, there's a couple of the lighter gray stripes there to emphasize the, the curve of the ship, the form. And there's a lot of very bright colors in fairly regular stripes. But it looks like to me that this was obviously painted by hand because the lines are not uh, machine-like accurate. Uh, the mood of the artwork feels to me that it's a little bit whimsical because of the bright colors, and there's a lot of energy going on. So that's that's all description. Now I look at analysis. I'm starting to try to figure out what was the artist trying to say? How did the artist do the different effects that they were doing? For the analysis, I'm kind of blending a little bit from that description, trying to figure out how they got different parts of the description. It looks to me like the elements are organized almost like some like a, a, a chain, almost. It's very chain link of the left form, and then the right kind of thing looks like it's interlacing with it somehow. Uh, the stripes feel like they are designed to engage you first because of the color, but also to guide your eye around and through the piece and to kind of make your eye appreciate the motion that's going on and appreciate the form because of the way it's, the colors are directing you to move through the piece. The overall mood of you know, it almost feels whimsical or lighthearted to some extent. I think that was achieved in a large part because of the directionality of all those stripes and all the bright colors. But I think there's also both that's achieved by the artist painting those color stripes on the black coat that was already there, and that's that's how I'm fe um, that's why I think there's a little bit of black showing through the colors. And I, I think that, that black is just kind of, I don't know if it would be dulling down the bright party-like atmosphere, but uh, definitely to me it feels like the artist is trying to communicate some sort of sense of um, foreboding somehow. Right now in interpretation, so that was analysis. The difference between description and analysis is description, you're talking about the impact of this piece on the observable world. You're talking about your observations. In analysis, you're trying to talk about getting to the mind of the artist a little bit in describing how you th think the artist went about achieving some of those observational descriptions that you saw. Now for interpretation, this is when I start guessing what the artist is thinking. Say, uh, if we talk about how accessible is the artwork, I really don't know. I don't know how much of this I'm seeing from the artist's mind and how much of this I am just laying on top. But that, that doesn't really matter so much because when I talk about interpretation, I'm talking about how I think the artist was was uh, doing this or what I think about what the artist was trying to say. So I, I think the artist is perhaps talking about things like energy. Um, they're also talking about things like inviting an observer in, uh, trying to engage people. And I think that that perhaps speaks to uh, the artist having uh, a bit of a sense of humor, perhaps. A worldview that maybe deals with ideas of 
positivity in the face of not so happy circumstances. Uh, for a personal example, when my mom died, my brothers and I, when it came time for the funeral, it was a couple of days after she had passed away, and we had already been able to start the processing what had been going on. She had been sick, really sick, for a couple of months, and so we, when, we, when it happened, it was not a surprise to anybody. Very disappointing, of course, but it was not a surprise, and we were all very confident that she had lived a very good life. So for the funeral on the day that we buried her, my brothers and I were actually joking and laughing. And uh, it got some very odd reactions from the rest of the people at the funeral and memorial services because you know, we were supposed to be the closest to us and we were acting like there was humor involved. And I think in, in our family, whenever a tragedy happens, one of the first things that we learned to do growing up was to process the tragedy by laying humor on top of it. And when I see this piece, because of the things like uh, the organic nature of some of the lines, the, the, the strength of the black, the black coming through some of those bright colors, I'm reminded of that kind of attitude where adversity is addressed with a little bit of humor. Overall, I, I think that this, um, interpreting this, I, I think that this deals with trying to express those kinds of ideas without the confines or restrictions of regular language. And then uh, the last one is judgment or evaluation. I believe that this piece is successful. I don't know exactly what the, the intrinsic value would be. I don't know if the, the value would be necessarily monetary, but I think it has value because there is a discussion going on and uh, there is an engagement. Perhaps there's a different way. Um, perhaps the discussion is inviting you just to and uh, I I really appreciate that. So I, I, I do think that this, I don't know if necessarily this is a expression of a religious belief, but I do believe that this is an expression of the artist's view, which I think is uh, quite a bit less pessimistic than perhaps sometimes we, we expect to see. All right. So I, I'm ending the, the screen share. Now that took a little bit longer than three minutes, but can you kind of see uh, some of the elements or the differences rather uh, among each of the four steps? I have a question when we're regarding when we're doing our own piece. Um, I know some of the examples I, when, when they, there? sorry, can you hear me? Uh, let me, you're, you're asking a question about doing your own uh, critique on your own artwork is that what you're doing okay yeah can you hear me yeah now i can uh the very best way to do that is to pretend when you look at your own piece that it's the first time you've ever seen it that's what i was wondering if we pretend like because we don't we won't know what we're thinking we just sort of make assumptions as if it's someone else's right and, and what is really fascinating is that everybody who's done that and i'm talking about every single person they learn new things about what they were doing than they knew when they made it, which I think is really fascinating. I'm going to do a screen share again, and we're going to talk, um, look at this again. Now, down here at the bottom, it has some student examples. And what I would like you to do, look at the student examples, but also do you remember the video we watched with us uh, looking at Henry Moore's reclining figure. Does everybody remember that? Watch that again and see if you can determine which of the four steps they are on at any given moment. And it's fascinating because you will notice that they jump back and forth 
between, for example, description and interpretation. Where they'll describe, for example, the string being set into the plaster, and then they'll talk about immediately how that affects your possible perception um, and maybe interpreting a little bit about what Henry Moore was trying to do. And then they'll go back to describing again and they'll keep bouncing back and forth. And what I would like you to do when you do this is try very hard to do the steps one after another. And the reason why I'm having you do that that way instead of all together is that this will help you to start developing this as a tool. And as you move forward in your career, this will become more and more uh, comfortable for you and you'll be able to just bounce around between the four among the four steps really easily. So pay attention to the, the different questions and you'll notice that I didn't address every single question. What I would like you to do when you do step one, which is your own work, and when you do step two, which is somebody else's, pick at least two questions from each of these four and address those two questions. You don't, I don't want you to feel obligated to address each of the questions one after another. And then at the bottom, I want you to pay a lot of attention to these vocabulary words. Now, some of the words that I used when I was talking were line, texture, and color. And I also talked a little bit about the shape. I talked about how the shape guided your eyes in different areas. Some of the things I did, I talked a little bit about the balance. What some of the things I did not address were a focal point or emphasis. I guess I listed that twice. <laughs> I talked a little bit about the scale, but uh, I don't want you to feel necessarily that you have to put every single word in there, but I would like you to do the best you can to engage as many as you can. Or uh, not, not as many as you can, but as many as you feel appropriate. All right. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you guys come up with. Again, two to three and a half minutes max. I wouldn't do anything under, under two minutes, and I wouldn't necessarily do anything over three and a half minutes. I went a little long because I was trying to uh, illustrate some points. And also, I'm a long-winded windbag. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. All right, now the next thing I wanted to talk about is just the, the texture project. As you, as you guys move forward on this, this is something that we kind of instituted new this summer, this kind of project, and I want you to engage yourself and have, have some fun with it. I'm going to do a screen share again. Let's see. Here we go. So we look at this, um, the census journey is, I, I, as some of you guys may know, I'm also a certified chaplain and I, I, I do some other things along those lines. But I, I work with some people that deal with anxiety. And uh, one, one of the things that I found is a really good meditation is a, a census walk or census journey. And this is where you find an area or you determine an area that you want to explore a little bit. And as you explore it, you, the important thing is to move through the environment trying very hard just to focus on what your senses are telling you. So, you know, you turn your, your phone off and you do everything you can to feel or hear, for example, your impact on the path that you're walking, the wind going through the trees, um, trying to explore as intently as possible while focusing on the visual textures around you. 
Perhaps you're feeling stuff. Sometimes it's good to sit down in the grass and let your fingers run through the grass. Sometimes it's good to just sit next to a stream while you're doing your, your journey and just really pay attention to the noise the water makes. And the whole purpose of this is to try to engage your senses as much as you possibly can. Focus on the smells, the sights, and the sounds. How everything feels through your clothing. Just as much as possible. And after you, after you do this uh, for a few minutes, look around you and see if you can gather legally something that represents some of the textures around you. Maybe go to another area and do the same thing. People have done this um, in their apartments, like during COVID. Uh, I think that this is really, if you can do this outside at a park, I think that's ideal. Um, if you can do this while you're out hiking or something like that. I Typically, when I hike, my principal motivation is, is uh, not to collapse in a dehydrated heap, but uh, sometimes on your hike, you can t pause a few moments and really extend your senses and do everything you can to feel as much as you can around, of the environment around you. So that, that's what the senses journey deals with, just focusing on your environment as much as possible. And then the second aspect of this kind of um, out of your workshop experience is I want you to go to uh, like the paint department at a Home Depot, a Lowe's, uh, Walmart sometimes will have them, other um, Ace Hardware will have them. All paint departments, well, I'm not going to say all because I haven't been to every single one, but most paint departments will have areas that you can go and see. Uh, you can get free samples of paints and what they look like with more white mixed in with a particular pigment. So you have uh, strips of color. Maybe you'll get uh, color chips of different kinds of paint. At uh, Lowe's and Home Depot, when you go to the paint department, they will also have little booklets that show different ways of combining colors. Like there's a booklet on uh, neutrals. There's a booklet on uh, using blues in your home. There's a, there's a booklet on exterior enamels. And though, check beforehand, but almost all the time, those types of things are free. If you go to a craft store like Joanne's Hobby Lobby or Michael's, you can go to areas like the, the paint area and they will also have a lot of the times these little one page uh, project idea pages. And uh, sometimes there, if it's more than one page, most of the time they're going to cost some money and we don't want to spend any money on this. We're looking for free stuff and that's it. Uh, but if you go to a couple of these different places, you'll be able to very quickly get a lot of free stuff. And I want you to make sure don't get, don't clean out any one place you go to. I would recommend going to Lowe's, get a couple of the paint strips that are really interesting to you and maybe an idea book booklet or two that are free. Go to uh, Home Depot, do the same kind of thing, finding different stuff. Go to a, a Joann's. Or uh, and several different places. I think if you clear one place out of all the free stuff, they probably are going to put your photo up on the board and make sure that you're not welcome to come back in the store. So I don't want you to do that. And then what you're going to do is take your free stuff, set it out, and you're going to go to... Let's see, down here, see right here this website that says Color Wheel? You're going to go to that website. Can everybody see this? Did the screen share yeah. show the yeah. going to the website? Okay. 
this is the website you're going to go to for the color uh, portion of the exercise. And what I want you to do is see it shows show, uh, choose a color combination. There are several different options. And I'll just show you how to use this, this um, really quickly. So there's five different options, complementary, monochromatic, analogous, triadic, and tetradic. What you're going to do for this exercise is you're going to pick three of these. And looking at your paint samples, you're going to use the color wheel to kind of help you make a little three inch by three inch collage, two of them for each of those three color combinations you've come up with. Like for example, complementary. If I, my favorite color is blue, so I'm going to go over to blue. And for this particular, let's see, I want a little bit stronger blue. There we go. For this particular version of blue, it shows the complementary being this kind of yellowy green. And so I will make a little collage where I'm using these two colors. And then make, and it's just a three inch by three inch collage. And maybe for the second three inch by three inch collage, I want to use red as my primary. That's it. It gives me this mint kind of green. So I'll make another collage with these two colors. And then um, maybe monochromatic. This is going to be my second choice of color combination. Again, I like blues. So I'm just going to use a couple different shades of blue. And maybe if I like green different shades of green and let's see for analogous same kind of thing do you see what's going on this uh this uh color wheel there's a billion of the color wheel type programs online but for this exercise i just try to find a really simple one to use and we go back to texture uh the the texture module that that color wheel, that exercise, that's where you're going to be using all those paint chips and free images from the, the product sources for, or project sources. So the two exercises for this are, first, you're going to be making a, um, three different three inch by three inch squares using your cardboard boxes uh, you're going to make, I'm sorry, let me start over explaining this. You're going to cut out using your cardboard boxes 12 identical 3 inch by 3 inch squares. And then with those, with six of those, you're going to pull out and you're going to apply to those six squares the textures that you kind of picked up on your senses walk. And you can also go crazy. You can do like this student here carved into the cardboard and that's how they made some of their textures and you could do that this student uh glued this cardboard onto their textures and they could and you could do that too uh people have glued covered theirs with the feathers they picked up on their senses walk with the grass with the crushed up leaves some people uh the leaves they did they split down the center and glued the edges of the leaves on that gave a really interesting fascinating texture to it other people took and just layered the grasses over and over each other. Some people did a uh, census journey outside as well as inside. And some of their texture tiles they made with scraps of material they found like uh, beads, uh, shoelaces, lint from the dryer, uh, bits of torn paper from the um, a waste basket, different things like that that they found in their own apartment. So far, I've been doing this kind of thing for 13 years. So far, not a single person has used bubble gum, chewed bubble gum. So that, that's an idea for somebody enterprising. But so th for the first half of this project, you're going to use six of those 12 tiles to, to uh, make textures, and then you're going to glue those together in a cube. 
So you have a texture cube. And for the second half, you're going to go to the, your color wheel exploration. Use those free guides that you picked up from a couple different stores. And you're going to make six tiles that are color collages. And out of those six tiles, you're going to pick three color combination options and do two tiles in each color combination option. Hopefully using different colors. Like if you're going to be doing two of the complementary, maybe the, the uh, one will be blue and orange and another one will be yellow and purple. And that'd be totally fine. After you make those six collages on the three by three squares, uh, then you're going to put that together into a cube as well. So by the time you're done with this project, you're going to have two cubes. One will be absolutely covered with the textures that you you found, and the other one cube will be absolutely covered with the different collages. And uh, when I send this video out today, I will also be sending out uh, images of previous students' works. All right, I'll, I'll, so you'll you'll kind of see what they were doing. And our third, let's see, our third uh, word for today, code word today, is texture, which is incredibly original given the subject matter. All right, I, I want to wind things up a little bit early, if that's okay with everybody. But does anybody have any questions about what we talked about today so far? Okay, I, again, I will send out images of those uh, those two different cubes. So for this texture project module, you're working with both physical textures and visual textures. And there's something that I want you to consider. If you're using your eyes, every texture is going to be initially, uh, or almost every texture is going to be initially a visual texture. And a lot of the physical textures you come up with, the, the way you first engage them is visually by seeing the, the shadows and the way that the, that physical texture distorts light. So, so think about that as well. But we're also dealing with, with color. And even though that's not texture in the way that we normally think of texture, I think that color fits in really well. Uh, there's a lot of times where, like for example, you look at a Vincent Van Gogh or a Monet, the way they use color, there is a very definite um, visceral, physical component going on. You feel that there's, even though you only see it visually, you feel some sort of a, a physical component. And I, I just think that that's really fascinating. So any questions today about any of the things we talked about? All right. I would like you guys to go to the YouTube channel check out the examples of the artistic critique and also look at a couple examples of the PowerPoints because we're moving into that as well. And like I said this week, I'm going to try to get all the grading done and caught up so that everybody knows where they stand. And later on this afternoon, I will send out images of the, the uh, cubes that other students have done. All right, so I hope you guys have a good couple days, and I will look forward to seeing y'all on Thursday afternoon. Okie dokie. All right, we'll see you guys. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.